Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Ty Lawsetter. I'm a clinical psychologist, um, and I am presenting today. Uh, I was also supposed to co-present with Dr. Nicole Bates, but Dr. Bates has been called away, and you will just be talking with me today. Um, we are planning on talking about mental health after transplant, and basically well-being after the first 100 days um, was the presentation that we've been asked to give. And I'm delighted to be here. So I'm going to start with just a little more introduction of myself. My name, as I said before, my name is Ty Lossiter. I'm trained as a clinical psychologist. I have done all of my training at the University of Washington. I first started there as an undergraduate. I worked there for six years as a research coordinator, developing and testing large research trials of psychotherapy, trying to make sure of what we do in therapy works, makes people feel better. I then went back and got my PhD from the Department of Psychology, and I and Dr. Bates are actually both from now the Department of Psychiatry in the School of Medicine. And we have both been working at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance or the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center um, for more than eight years now. Um, so it is my pleasure to bring, the, bring this presentation to you. Um, we would like to start with quick uh, 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 land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge along with Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center that our site sits on traditional lands by the people of Seattle, the Duwamish tribes and others. And we uh, recognize the past and the present um, and honor with gratitude its land itself and the Duwamish tribes. As a reminder, um, all of these presentations are being recorded so that they can be used for future work use. Um, I've been asked to remind people to leave their mics muted for this time, but there will be a question and answer portion after this presentation. Um, so today we were trying to figure out uh, what we would like to talk about. And so what we decided to do was kind of look at six areas. Um, one will end on an expert uh, on what we would call an experiential exercise that we will try. But basically what we'd like to cover today is the psychosocial impacts of what cancer and transplant can do, the distress that a cancer diagnosis gives someone, challenging the transplant of survivorship, and then the impacts also of mental health and COVID, which of course are still running rampant in our society. And then we're going to talk specifically about strategies that you can use for resiliency or to cope. And one of those exercises is going to lead us to actually practice um, some exercises in session, hopefully, just to give you an experience of what those might look like. So when we talk about, there we go, sorry. Uh, when we talk about cancer and transplant in general, uh, we know that there are lots of different domains of your life that could be impacted. And I'm probably preaching to the choir in some ways and that um, you know a lot of this, but we're just gonna cover it gently that there are things like um, a diagnosis of cancer and the impact of having a transplant can affect you financially, which could add to a mental health component, um, personal integrity, what's happening with my body, what's happening with my life, your quality of life, thoughts or concerns about mortality, issues around family, your friends, how you're going, changes that may occur because of role functioning. So how you change um, and what roles you take up in your life. It may affect things like identity. How do you see yourself and how you define yourself um, before and after a cancer and transplant process? It can also affect your spirituality. And all of those components can be changed or altered in a way that the individual has to figure out either an adjustment to that. What is this all going to look like now that I'm undergoing these procedures and this particular diagnosis? What we know about that is that overall in what we call a mental health distress. Distress is defined as an unpleasant emotional experience that can interfere with effective coping during cancer treatment. And it ranges, right? There's no just one side of distress and probably it, it shifts around throughout the course of both diagnosis, treatment, and post-treatment. And so the idea is that you can go from normal sadness and, and vulnerability to a more extreme version, which can be debilitating and can give you what we would label as mental health diagnoses like depression, anxiety. It also leads to isolation and what we would also call existential crisis, kind of like what's the meaning of life kind of uh, issues that people are dealing with. And so one of the ways that we know is once one experiences distress, is that that distress can clearly impact people's lives. Oops. 
So what we know is that in, uh, distress can impact um, lots of different places. It can affect your physical health, which of course is already occurring because of the cancer and sometimes the side effects of the treatment that you're receiving. It can also, also cause longer hospital stays. It can actually interrupt or interfere with your um, satisfaction with your medical care. It can lower your functioning in life. It can clearly impact your quality of life. It of course is related to higher mortality. And in our world that uh, Nicole and I deal with, it actually does deal with uh, greater increases of risk of a psychiatric disorder, such as, like I said, anxiety, depression, um, to a debilitating level. However, it can also, as a transplant survivor, give you a different perspective on life. And I put up this image, and actually Nicole and I discussed whether this image is, we don't want people to overly be over-optimistic that now that you've finished a transplant process, you should feel, hallelujah, everything's great, because sometimes people don't feel that. So our, our question isn't to you to put to like, say everything's fine now. Although lots of people do experience that sensation of being done and that success and, um, I, what Dr. Lee was just talking about in a previous discussion, this idea of gratitude and having a different reflection of what this experience has done to your meaning of life. But we do know that challenges in transplant do cause physical burdens, like we were just discussing in the last session, GVHD and other things that occur. It can change your cognitive and mood abilities and functions. There can actually be a great deal of anxiety or um, dealing with the unknown future of what's going to happen next. It can increase um, a loss of social connection. So a lot of time because of transplant and because of even now with COVID, we've lost a lot of social connections or those things that we would normally do to actually make ourselves feel better. It can change your loss of function or a change in function. And it can give you a different identity of being kind of a lifelong patient, um, which may be not something that someone was expecting or experiencing. The other component that we want to be very mindful of, of course, is that um, all of this happened during the midst of a global pandemic. And what we primarily know is that the global pandemic, even if you weren't dealing with cancer, also left a lot of the big population feeling isolated from one another, dealing with fear and uncertainty and changes in all sorts of ways in which our life was not normal. I took this two ways actually. During the pandemic, one of the things that I know is that lots of transplant patients had already experienced all of this and actually started to manage and cope how they dealt with isolation and being away from people. Um, so a lot of the time when I was actually working with patients and, and transplant and cancer patients in general who had been immunocompromised, they had been dealing with these issues long before COVID got around. And so in some ways, my cancer patients were more prepared or better prepared to deal with COVID. And actually a lot of them would teach some of the skills or the things that they had learned about how to protect themselves and their immune system during co uh, cancer to their, uh, now the non-cancer family members or, or friends that they were around of how to manage living that life as though COVID were like a cancer in some ways. And so in actuality, the parallels actually gave sometimes um, patients more strength or more resiliency to deal with COVID. But there was that compounding fear that already being a transplant patient probably left people with the enhanced worry of uncertainty if I got COVID and I'm fighting this cancer and undergoing a transplant, am I more at risk for death? Um, and so that was the issue or the uncertainty that still faces a lot of people today. And we want to both acknowledge that that is still there and at the same time acknowledge that the medical society continues to advance quickly on treating COVID in a way that we would normally be able to detect it and actually hopefully treat even patients who's undergone transplants of how they would survive a COVID-19. I will actually say that I, more recently, I've seen several of our patients at Fred Hutchinson um, been exposed and actually survive COVID as well as having cancer. So just getting a COVID diagnosis does not mean that someone is going to inevitably die. We've actually been able to make so much progress in the treatment of COVID and also ways to protect our cancer patients that this is actually um, a lower threat than it was at the beginning of the pandemic. But we still wanna recognize that this has probably had a toll on people's mental health COVID alone has changed things and COVID combined with the fact of you're dealing with cancer transplant or post-transplant life can also affect how you feel and how you deal with that distress. 
That being said, there's also very specific strategies that you that a lot of my patients um, have already been dealing with in, this, in the form of what we would call resilience or effective coping. Um, one of the things that we normally tell people is actually they, that trying to find ways to do the things that you already enjoy. So a lot of what happens when someone's ill, regardless of illness, is that people tend to isolate. They tend to pull back. And actually, sometimes I'll even use the example that people will sit on the couch and they'll say to themselves, when I feel better, I'll go for my walk or I'll go visit a friend or they'll go do something when they feel better. And they wait and they wait and they wait to feel better. And what happens is a lot of the time our mood doesn't change that quickly, just waiting for it to happen. Instead, what we tell people is if you went out and did those things, regardless of how you felt, what most people experience after the fact is they felt better after they do the event or go do something. And so one of the things we try to encourage is in psychology, we call behavioral activation, activating your behaviors, doing things that you like to do or things that give you a sense of purpose or a sense of accomplishment is a great strategy. It actually affects your um, dopamine center in your brain. It's kind of your natural antidepressant. And so doing those activities actually helps you feel more resistant, resilient and actually helps lower depression and anxiety. So what we try to tell people, even during the midst of transplant, is to try to find some ways. Now, sometimes we have to be tricky and find substitutions. So there might be activities that you are been told um, during your transplant you can't do. So we can see if we can find substitutes or other activities that you've not tried that you might be able to do as a substitution until you can go and resume those activities. But the idea of doing things is important. It's also very important to stay active physically, intellectually, and socially. So again, doing things that you, to the best of your ability, before and after transplant. We also talk about maintaining a daily routine. So the idea a lot of the time is those who are in transplant sometimes are actually on some sort of leave of absence from either school or work, and it disrupts your regular routines. And a lot of the time, our mood is dependent on actually routine. And so what we try to tell people in mental health is that by establishing a routine, what time do you get up? What time do you go to bed? What time do you eat lunch? What activities are you scheduling in between each of those activities? Those are ways to, again, find yourself or find that hope of resilience to keep going on. We also try to change perspective. So in mental health, we try to actually point out there's a lot of things in the world you can't control, but if you move your attention to the things that you can, you can feel better. So we move people's attention. We try to maintain um, principles that are important to you, living your life, your values and goals, despite what you're going through, spending more time in the present, which is a mindfulness task, and we will talk a little more about that. Um, we will, again, a lot of the time people want to isolate because they don't feel well, but natural lot of support from families and friends can be an important aspect of resilience. And actually doing stress reduction practices, so things like mindfulness, yoga, just a general walk, all of those things. And the idea is when you get stuck is to be able to ask for help. And you can ask for help a couple of different ways. You can ask for help within your social group, or there may be times when you are feeling really distressed and it's time to ask for help from a professional. So someone in psychology or psychiatry or your clinical social worker or our spiritual care center. There are lots of integrative medicine, your physicians and ask them for ideas. There are lots of ways that you can ask for help to help boost your resiliency either during or after transplant. So we've come to a point where basically um, we were gonna try to do some uh, actual experiential ways to help people actually manage distress. And distress again could be what's going on in your life today besides just transplant. So every person I know could actually use these skills. They're, they're actually um, quite useful to teach everyone. Um, the first one that we're gonna teach is actually diaphragmatic breathing. Now diaphragmatic breathing is talking about the muscle, the diaphragm muscle that's underneath your stomach and it expands and contracts like a balloon. And so this is an exercise. Now I always tell people breathing actually has been considered kind of the thermostat of your brain. The more you can regulate your breathing and change the amount of oxygen, you can change how you feel physiologically and psychologically. And so diaphragmatic breathing is a way. So what we know is that when people are feeling really, really stressed, they will sometimes start to breathe really shallow. They'll just breathe quickly. <sighs> And that actually creates less oxygen in your blood system. And that actually can increase kind of panic symptoms or anxiety feelings in oneself. Actually, 
This is a way of controlling or slowing down your breath in a way that gives you control both physiologically and then that affects your psychological. So diaphragmatic breathing is a very interesting tool. Sometimes it actually helps people to put a hand on their chest and one kind of on their belly. So what we're going to do is take four breaths or we're going to we're going to count to four while we breathe. We're going to slowly breathe in through our nose and mouth. We're going to fill our lungs with air. And when you do that, what you should also feel is your abdomen starts to poke out. That's where your diaphragmatic breathing lets you know that you've expanded as big as you can. And then when you breathe out, you're gonna breathe out in a way that you should both feel the tightening of your stomach muscles to actually push the air out of your lungs and control. So we'll try to do this together. I'm gonna to put my hands on my, on my posture. If you are sitting comfortably wherever you are, or if you're holding a device and you could put it down, what you could do is just listen to me. We're gonna do a count of four. I'm gonna count out loud and tell you kind of what to do. So we're gonna breathe in through your nose and mouth. Fill your lungs with air, feel your abdomen expand, hold, and then breathe out. Slowly breathe it out and push all the air out of your lungs as hard as you can. We're gonna do that again. Breathe in and breathe out. And breathe in and breathe out. And that is a skill for diaphragmatic breathing. The idea here again, is that by controlling your breath, you're gonna actually start to feel an increase of oxygen flowing through your blood. And that actually helps dial back anxiety symptoms or stress, but this is a great way to do this. Now, I try to have people try to do diaphragmatic breathing a couple of times throughout their day in some ways. So doing this is an activity that you can do in lots of different settings when you're not feeling stressed. So to learn the skill, you wanna do it when you're not stressed so that when you are really stressed out, you can immediately start using it when you actually know what you're doing. So the idea of practicing it sometimes in the morning, either before breakfast or after breakfast, you can do it at the end of your day. You can do it lying down actually in your bed even if that's more comfortable. But the idea of trying to control your breath and focus on that breath will actually give you a better sense of space, time, and feel better. It's a great way to control how you're feeling. The other thing that we were going to practice today is this thing that um, is called mindfulness. It's a type of meditation practice. And I start by telling everyone, I did not want to learn meditation. When I was in grad school, which is where I started developing my meditation practice, I was the squeaky wheel in grad school who didn't think this would be helpful and didn't want to learn it, partly because I misunderstood the concepts of it. So now I'm hoping to teach it to you in a way. I am now a practitioner. I practiced this morning. We practice mindfulness every day at my household. But the idea is that we try this meditation practice. And it has now been found with a bunch of research behind it that it is very effective for all sorts of patients. I treat it with all of my patients in cancer, but I also treat it to all my other patients who don't have cancer, because this is just, again, a robust skill that actually helps us cope with our life. So the definition that I use of mindfulness is this thing. It's the awareness that emerges by paying attention on purpose to the present moment, moment by moment by moment, non-judgmentally. And so there are four key elements here. You're using your cognitive ability, the attention, like you're doing now, paying attention to me on the computer or on your screen, watching me, hopefully. That's moving your attention to where it is. Now, your attention can also get pulled. Someone could like do something and you could move your attention. If that happens, what you're asked to do is simply bring your attention back. Now, the other thing is we tell you that you're doing this on purpose, which means you're using your cognitive ability on purpose, meaning you're being present and you're doing it into the present moment. And then the last piece is that, and I think this is the part that people sometimes skip over of mindfulness. You're also gonna practice this, this value of non-judgmentalness, this idea of not judging whatever the experience you have, whether, and so not labeling that was good or bad, but just experiencing it for experience and shape. I tell people all the time that we are not the best at not being non-judgmental. If you think about it, if you look at almost any TV program, we judge everything from who's the best dancer, who's the best singer, who made the best cupcakes this week, and we rank order and decide who gets the prize. We do this all the time, and we do it for ourselves. We judge ourselves really harshly. We have kind of a voice in our head that's like, oh, why did I do that? I'm so stupid. We say things about us. This idea of non-judgmentalness is an important part. This idea of not being judgmental of ourselves or others is also an important part of mindfulness. Now, the reason we think this is helpful for 
mental health is, is if you think about the way we even define mental health. So if you think about your past and you don't like what happened in your past, we call that or label that depression, especially if you spend a lot of time reliving your past and thinking about your past. You can also spend a lot of the time thinking about your future, what could happen, because you have this amazing brain that lets you play these scenarios out in your head and pay attention to them. And that means your attention is being pulled in the future. We label that when you worry about the future anxiety. Most of the time where you're feeling, if you actually moved your attention back to the present, you're most of the time in the present doing okay. And so if you can't really be in two places uh, at once with your attention, the idea of moving your attention back to the present means you will spend less time in anxiety or depression. And so that is why using mindfulness as a skill can actually be very helpful for mental health. And now, like I said before, there's a great deal of research. So there are new studies that basically show that we can scan people's brains before they learn to meditate and after they learn to meditate. And some of these studies have been done with only eight weeks of people practicing meditation in eight weeks or more. The studies basically confirm the following things. You change your physiological brain by actually practicing meditation every day. It actually saw a thickening of brain tissue on the outside of your brain and on the inside of your brain. And then those neurological changes that occurred actually also then increase things like you get better at moving your attention and holding it longer. People in the studies actually increase their amount of empathy, their feelings towards themselves and other people. It actually helped decrease mental health symptoms. It lowered anxiety, it lowers depression, and it lowers PTSD symptoms. Every study showed that people who were in these studies of meditation, mindfulness explicitly, reported less stress, meaning they feel less stressed out. And they did that two ways. We measured it one by just, do you feel less stressed? And the other was to actually measure the cortisol level in your life. Like uh, cortisol is a hormone that you secrete when you are stressed. People in the meditation group actually had less cortisol or less stress hormone. So we know physiologically this also affects by practicing mindfulness. It actually had positive impacts on people's brains and it seemed to boost people's immune systems. It helps with chronic pain issues. It helps with insomnia. So if those of you are having problems with sleeping, mindfulness might be an antidote or helpful thing to you. And believe it or not, I teach this skill to lots of my healthcare providers. I just taught this about three months ago to the nursing staff here at FHCC. So I teach this all the time because actually mindfulness actually makes us better healthcare providers. So I teach it to our docs and our nurses all the time. Now, I teach it two ways. There is formal practice, and formal practice is now what I call gem time. Formal practices means you're just gonna do 20 minutes or 30 minutes a day or five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day. I don't care what it is, it's time limited, and you're gonna sit in a calm posture like we were just doing with, with uh, diaphragmatic breathing. You can sit or lie comfortably. There's nothing that interesting about it. You just sit, and what we normally do is move our attention to the present, by focusing on an anchor to the present, most of the time we'll start with breath because believe it or not, all of you have been breathing this entire time and you haven't had to tell yourself to breathe. It's an automatic process. But if I ask you to pay attention to it, you will notice that you are breathing in and out and that noticing of that sensation becomes your anchor to the present. So that's that way. And there's evidence that those who do formal practice on a regular basis reduce all of those symptoms I just talked about. There's another way to practice too, and lots of people have experienced this. It's actually designed to improve your quality of life. And that is mindful, like informal mindfulness. So that means like if you're going for a walk, like since most of you are adults, you know how to walk and even talk at the same time. But if you're doing a mindfulness walk, you would be in your head purposely saying, I'm going to describe everything I see, feel, touch, smell, hear, all of my sensations are being used so that I'm actually on the walk and I'm not in my head thinking about appointments, what I'm having for dinner tomorrow, anything like else, because that's being somewhere else. So the idea of moving your attention to the present, you can do that with any activity. I have assigned it to mindfulness showering, mindfulness dishwashing, mindfulness eating, mindfulness walking, you name it, you can turn any activity into mindfulness. And some things like um, gardening or other act, art, all other activities can be a mindful event. And if they bring you joy or pleasure, that's why it will increase your quality of life. And then finally, when I try to help people practice mindfulness, what I try to remind them of is the fact that 
uh, we want them to practice and understand what this is. There's a misperception that most people who meditate are in some blissful state of nirvana or bliss or no words or no sounds or something, that they're in this wonderful state. Most people who meditate will find a target, like I said, breath. What will happen is their mind will wander off that breath. They will notice that they've wandered off breath. And what we're asking you to do is simply go back to the task at hand, focusing on breath. And you're gonna do that over and over and over again for a set period of time. So if we say you're gonna meditate for 20 minutes a day, what you find is that you may wander 100 times, you simply bring it back. That's all you're being asked to do. And you're being asked to do that, again, non-judgmentally. So basically the take home message that I try to tell people with meditation is that meditation now is exercise for your brain. And that's that repetition that someone would do to get bigger biceps, like picking up weights and going one, two, and doing three sets of, or three sets of 10 over time changes their person's muscle mass. It's the same idea. If your mind wanders and you bring it back and wanders and bring it back, those are repetitions that change the neurology, the neurostructure, and then that changes your cognitive ability. So before we end and I open it up to questions, what I would like to do is just spend two or three minutes for everyone trying to also practice mindfulness. So what I would like you to do if you're comfortable doing this, normally I would have people close their eyes. I'm gonna guide you through a meditation practice and I'm gonna do this with you. And we are gonna do three minutes of guided meditation on breath. And so what I would like you to do is close your eyes if you're willing to do so, get comfortable, Now, I would like you to just, for a moment, just sit in your body, just feel whatever sensations you're feeling. Could be the weight as you're sitting on a cushion or a chair or lying down, however you're feeling it, just feel what your body feels right now. Where is it touching things, the weight and the inside of your body? How does that feel? What states are going on with you? And now I would like you to turn your attention to your breath. So I'd like you to turn to however you feel the sensation of breath. You might feel it in your nose or your nostrils. You might feel it on the top of your lip as you breathe out. I want you to feel it when it breathes in, what it feels like to breathe in. You might feel an expansion of your chest, your stomach, just like we did with diaphragmatic breathing. You're gonna feel the sensation in. And I would like you to feel the sensation going out. And you can do it either through your nose or mouth, it doesn't matter, but I want you to feel the sensation of out breath, an in breath and an out breath. And an in breath and an out breath. And we're just gonna do this together quietly for just another minute or two. And while we do this, you may notice that your mind may start to wander. It may start thinking, mm, I'm hungry now, or a body sensation, or a sound in the room. That's okay, it's actually normal. If you experience wandering mind, you can simply say wandering or thinking to yourself. And whenever you notice it wanders, now bring it back to breath what it feels like to breathe in, what it feels like to breathe out. In, out. We're just gonna do this in silence for just another minute. Now, when you're ready, I'm gonna have you open your eyes and come back into the room, wherever you are. I'm gonna thank you for listening to me. I hope that either of these skills will be something that you'll be able to use in your own life or share with others. Or if you're looking for more resources, you can simply Google the words mindfulness meditation or diaphragmatic breathing, and you will find tools or ways to help you with that. And in the meantime, I am gonna open it up for questions.